usually I would recommend that you start on your sky and then go back to the space between the hillside and your trees explicitly because your hillside might still be wet. So why don't we try to start adding a wash of brown in the space between our trees and our hillside on the area that's dry or much more dry than the area that seems to be wet. I think we got a little bit of a slight shimmer here on our left hand side. So I'm going to start on the right here with a wash of brown. I'm not using a super large flat. I'm actually using a medium to help spread this color around. This is my filler shade. And when I say filler shade, I'm literally just using this brown to kind of fill in the shape. So that way when I add my secondary layer of dark brown or secondary layer of brown, this, um, this light brown in the background will kind of look like a blurred set of trees that are sitting beyond the trees that are closest to my viewer, if that makes sense. It is a strategic method of how to create kind of more of a realistic flair to your artwork by creating like a blurred background. Think of like photography or what have you. So we're going to work on one side of our paper all the way to on the other side and we're just going to spread this brown around and give it a minute to rest before going back and adding more paint. So while I'm waiting for this space to kind of dry in the background, I am going to switch out my water clean out my brush and make sure that I am ready to start adding a wash of blue to my sky. Now when I'm doing this I would prefer to use like a medium brush and a small brush. Tiny small brush for the areas or clumpy areas where your trees meet the skyline specifically so that you do not reignite the yellow and red and orange paint into your sky. You don't want your trees exploding in the background. So I would use your smaller brush and chisel your way through those tiny areas. But with your larger flat, you could do a strip of water and a strip of paint and kind of create like a wash. I'm going to go back and forth in a streaky motion to kind of create, I don't know what they're technically called. I think they're called the cirrus uh, cirrus clouds but that's kind of what I'm aiming for are those streaky clouds in the background I might even use some of the white of my paper to kind of create the cloud itself and then use the blue of my brush to create this the the blue of sky background that peeps through the cirrus clouds totally up to you though this is your art your choice you decide how you want to do your clouds you could also use a cotton ball to kind of lift up some of that paint to kind of create a fluffy cloud as well if you choose to do so at this point your sky's done your trees are done and by now that brown space in between your tree and your hillside should be dry enough to work with um, quite frankly, you could leave it like this or do the dabbing technique to add clumps of dirt or you could do the dry on dry technique where you're using lots of paint, very little water and you're kind of creating uh, the skinny branches and tree trunks uh, underneath your the base of each tree. Totally up to you though on how you wish to do it. If you do decide to do the the tree the tree trunks, just make sure that you're very careful with the amount of water you're using and you're using it an intense amount of paint and a very skinny brush. And that my friend is exactly how you can create a beautiful kawaii quail using watercolor. Now that we've finished our quail, it is now time to work on the background. We're going to do this with a series of washes, like super, super wet, wet brush, and lots and lots and lots of paint. I'm going to do a set of fall trees, <clears throat> and I'm going to do this by using really bright oranges, reds, and yellows. Let's start off with our lighter colors here. And you can literally see how much pay, uh, water I have on my brush because I have little puddles. This is called the dabbing technique. I have like 
puddles of paint on my brush and I'm dabbing these puddles of paint onto the surface of my paper to kind of create like a bumpy textured feel. This is going to give the viewers the illusion of seeing tree leaves and tree clumps way off into the distance. If you need to make an area darker, feel free to dab some extra paint on there without the excess water and naturally those areas of double layered paint are going to get darker than the other areas of your tree. We're going to repeat this process with our other colors too. Now when doing this you might have to wait for your first layer to dry before adding your second layer. But keep in mind your first layer is going to be your lightest value your second value or your medium value is going to have at least two layers of paint on it and your third layer of value or your third layer of paint is going to create that dark shadowy spot that you'd see underneath your tree clumps and leaves. If you're finding that the application of paint isn't really sticking well and it's just moving around in a puddly mess on the paper, just wait for that first layer to dry before adding your additional layer uh, on your tree's body. This will ensure that your watercolor sticks to the paper and isn't sliding all over the place. Now that we have our orange color in, let's repeat this process with red and also with yellow. Now preferably I'd like to start with yellow first, then move to orange and then red because the paint inside your paintbrush or your bristles, when it hits the water, it disperses into the water and fills it with that paint color. So if you were to use a lighter color after you use a darker color, that darker color that's been dispersed in the water actually will end up tinting or tainting your yellow color when you put it down on the paper. But I noticed that I made this mistake, so I went and I got fresh water before doing my yellow. So just keep that in mind when you are working with colors to try to start from your lightest to darkest to help prevent accident color mixtures. Because if you're ever doing something like sand or let's say uh, something like, like a golden flower petal and you already did maybe the stem or the sky, your petal or your sand will end up looking bluish green instead of the color that you had originally intended. And for the yellow tree itself, you might want to add just a dot of bittersweet brown or what have you, maybe like a gold, to kind of help darken that color to create that shadow. Or you're going to be doing lots of additional uh, layers to get that dark, dark yellow that you're looking for. All right, now that we have our trees in there, let's give them a chance to kind of rest and settle themselves into the paper. This will give it an ample amount of time or opportunity for your trees to dry before we add those trunks. Because we don't want our trunks to kind of mix into our tree color. They're brown, we want to stay in the trunk area. But if your paper's super wet, that's exactly what's going to happen. So let's clean off our brush and get a really large flat and get it nice and damp. And what you can do is you can use green or uh, light green or dark green to create a wash of color. Here I have a pretty decently wet brush and I am just adding a little bit of water, adding a little bit of paint, and doing a side diagonal stroke from one side of my paper to the other. Obviously I'm leaving some space in between my hillside and the bottom side of my trees for my trunks. But we just want to make sure that this area is nice and dry before we add an additional set of paint uh, against that tree area. So what you can do here is you can use different line strokes. Like right here I have more of a curved line instead of a side diagonal hatch to kind of imply that there's a secondary hill that's going on here. You can use lines to help differentiate spaces or objects from each other. 
if you're using a flat or a well if you're using a flat you want to run your bristles up against the edge of your bird and kind of move your way out I'd also recommend that if you're using a round filbert that's kind of what I'm using but you just want to make sure that you go really slow around the bird's body you don't want to risk it getting that area wet again and reigniting that black paint into your hillside so when you're ready to move underneath the bird and in your legs, if you're using a large flat, I highly recommend that you switch to a smaller brush. This is going to give you more control to wiggle through those tight and tiny spaces without accidentally reigniting that black into your hillside. Just like with your trees, you could decide to add an additional layer of color for one of the hills to help differentiate or separate the two. Oh, and by the way, I used oil pastel for my legs, so I'm just painting over them and not worrying about the color being reignited. If you prefer the lazy method like I do, then feel free to draw your legs in using oil pastel instead of watercolor paint. At this current moment in time, I feel like my green is way too bright and springy. I kind of was looking more for like an olive or a dark green feel to kind of complement my reds and oranges and fall colors that I have in the background. Because you don't really see bright springy grass in the middle of fall. It's more of like a darker color because it's been through all the summer heat, it's been worn down, and what have you. So I'm going to actually add an additional layer of green on top and I am going to try to make it a little bit more darker in an olive kind of color fashion. And then I'll leave the green that I have right here underneath to help pop through that layer of dark green to kind of help lighten, up, lighten it up just a little bit, but not so much where it looks like my quail is standing on a ground during the springtime with fall colors in the background because that's a big no-no.